So welcome to our March Global Bean uh, monthly meeting. Today we are going to talk about how to grow some exotic legume species, at least what we would call exotic uh, here in our Central European climates. So legume species we are not used to see every day and uh, we are going to hear some stories about them today and also um, hear where we can find them at the end of the meetings. And I leave the word to Nicola Carton, who is coordinating a bit the session today and who will present you the agenda. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's been a pleasure to coordinate this meeting together with Victor, who is one of the speakers today. Just a quick look at the agenda. Uh, Eka is going to give us a, a quick introduction, then we will have four presentations for about one hour. You can ask your, a few questions at the end of, of each presentation. Uh, I'm going to present you a few uh, places where you can find seeds. Um, and then we, Lisa will talk about the next Global Bean event, which is a seed festival in April. And then we will have some time left for a short uh, discussion and if you have more questions for the speakers. So I, I leave the word to Eke, who is going to introduce. He had the, the idea of, of having this topic as a Global Bean meeting. So he's going to tell, tell us what was his uh, idea and why, why it's interesting to look at exotic species. Eke, please. Yeah, uh, hello to everyone. Um, my name is Eckhard Spiegel. I am um, working at the Global Plot in Berlin. The Global Plot shows uh, the state of agriculture um, uh, uh, calculated over one uh, person. And uh, we have quite a, um, a legume plot. Yeah? Part of uh, the global agriculture is, of course, all legumes grown. And this was a little bit the background why I wanted to dive into this uh, topic of uh, not so well-known uh, legumes. And not so well-known, of course, means from a European perspective, because um, yeah, we have a very narrow understanding, uh, most of us, uh, a very narrow understanding what uh, a legume is. We know our uh, legumes. and. Uh, we also have a rather um, yeah, narrow understanding even of the term bean. Yeah? Bean can mean many things. I'm coming to that uh, later in my presentation. So we are happy to have uh, Lucas Murao today uh, from, from Brazil, uh, Victor Garcia Moreno from uh, Spain, and Hyung Moon, I hope I didn't butcher the name too much, uh, from Korea. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful having such uh, interesting pre presentations before I hold mine and I hope I can uh, come up to the standard given by my other uh, co-hosts uh, here. Good. Um, so the objective is a little bit, uh, at least to me, is uh, to make you all a bit more acquainted with uh, legumes which would be nice to grow even here in Europe, and uh, most of them, at least the ones uh, uh, that I will present, uh, uh, can be grown here in Europe. And to add a little more interest to your garden, to to try something new, to um, uh, or not even not only on your garden, but also to have uh, some beautiful flowers on on your balcony. Uh, even uh, there are a few of them which are quite ornamental, quite uh, nice to look at. Um, yeah, that's all from my side. Um, uh, maybe you would start with the first presentation, I would suppose. Exactly. Thanks a lot, Ecke. Nice introduction to the diversity of legumes, of speakers, of the people in the public. So I just give the word to Lucas, who is joining us from Brazil. We met him at the Terra Madre event in Italy in, in September, and he's going to tell us what he what his view on an exotic legume species is. So please, Lucas. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you about uh, beans and education on social biodiversity in Brazilian posts. Uh, my, my main goal here is to present an overview about uh, Brazilian pulses and uh, that are um, most 
most known and consumed and the less known and consumed by people on uh, major urban centers. Because uh, my project that is called Jaca Verde Punk, that in English is a uh, kind of uh, green jackfruit or uh, immature jackfruit, uh, is aimed to um, promote the, these um, plants that we call here punk through educational courses, workshops, uh, culinary and uh, on landscaping. But what does it mean? It's an acronym that in uh, Portuguese it's non conventionalized. And in English, it's kind of non conventional edible plants. But we have similar names in English uh, that are uh, promoted on international literature that. Uh, are, for example, in US, that uh, it means neglected and underutilized species. Uh, and in, in Spanish, we have this other term that uh, it's called malezas comestibles, that uh, are kind of the same uh, uh, idea to uh, give highlights to these plants that are neglected and underutilized less seen in the commerce and less cultivated, despite their cultural relevance, because every plant has a, um, a, a history behind it of uh, some people, some culture. And this is what it's mo the most beautiful thing to talk about plants, in my opinion. It's to highlight their cultural aspects. So uh, these plants, these uh, NUS, reflect the abundance, uh, wait just a moment, the abundance of our social biodiversity, because the, our diversity is not um, important alone. It is uh, linked with our social aspects, uh, with our people, with our cultures. You can go to the next slide. Well, in Brazil, it's uh, very interesting because it's a huge country. It's a continental country. And uh, we have many different cultures and people all around our territory. And uh, we have different patterns of bean consumption as well. Bean and rice is our um, main uh, lunch dish that we have every day in Brazil, uh, but on the, our, our south region, south and southeast region, we use more of these um, specific types of beans. There are feijão carioca, feijão preto, and feijão vermelho. All of them fazer os vulgares. Uh, that in English we we can say that are common or pinto black red bean, and they can be used as a uh, when green as vegetable, here we call a uh, vagin, that uh, in English is called pod. Or when dry, we use in soups, stews, etc. Um, um, a few minutes ago, I was launching uh, red beans, very tasty, very delicious. Um, they are more used in the salt and southeast regions of Brazil. And feijão fradinho or feijão de corda, that in English you know by black-eyed beans uh, from the species uh, Vinha uniculata. We have many varieties of these species here, and they are more used in uh, culinary of North and Northeast regions of the country. And their uses are uh, a little bit different. And they are used on green, uh, when green as vegetable, or in farofas, that I will explain on the next slide, or dry in stews, fritters, etc. You can go. Uh, just to um, give an example, example, these are pinto beans, the first one, the second uh, are the reds, um, very used on my region, that it's called Minas Gerais. And uh, these are the black beans, um, below, we have uh, the black-eyed beans, 
one variety. Um, on the right, we have another variety of black eyed beans. And uh, on the right of this image, we have the green black eyed beans <laughs> that are used on salads, farofa, etc. You can go next. Here is the map of Brazil with uh, our regions. And north and northeast that are um, close to the tropic, uh, or close to the equator line, uh, they have a warmer climate. So uh, these black eyed beans are, are better to cultivate on these regions. That is why it's, they are more used on these regions. And on southeast, uh, I'm here, Minas Gerais is here. Uh, and south of Brazil, we have more of these other uh, beans, like pinto beans, black beans, red beans. On Central West, uh, it's kind of a mixture of these two great regions here. We can go next. Well, some traditional recipes with beans in Brazil. Um, you can go next, and I will tell uh, image by image which one is it. This first one is a uh, tutu de feijão. Tutu de feijão, it's uh, pinto beans that are cooked, uh, overcooked, and then they are mashed and uh, mixed with uh, manioc flour or cassava flour to be more um, like a cream. You know? uh, on the right, we have uh, feijão tropeiro, that is kind of uh, beans, pinto beans or red beans mixed with uh, kale, with uh, manioc or um, corn flour, and uh, with uh, pork and meat, and many things mixed with uh, beans. And it's a traditional dish here in Minas Gerais because of our um, past history of, of the bandeirantes that uh, were people that uh, explored uh, Brazil um, on the countryside. Then, and then we have here uh, rice with beans uh, that it's called Bayon de Dois. And it's a typical combination mixture of uh, cereal and uh, pulses. We have here uh, um, uh, below feijoada, the most uh, known Brazilian dish uh, um, abroad that it's made with uh, black beans black beans with um, many um, pork meat uh, and uh, kale and rice. Then we have here a typical dish of, from the Northeast region that it's uh, vinagrete. It's kind of uh, black eyed beans mixed with um, tomatoes, on, um, purple onions and coriander. It's a uh, very delicious, very tasty. And uh, here it's it's one of the dishes that I, it, one, of my, one of my favorites that it's acarajé. It's made from uh, black eyed beans that are um, um, mixed. <laughs> and then uh, it's a batter of, of the, these beans that are um, fried on palm oil. That is why it has this color. And then when after ready, it's ready, you uh, cut uh, on the middle of this uh, little cake and put uh, many things inside it, uh, such as uh, vatapá, that is a cream made with the cashew nuts and uh, tomatoes, and uh, uh, vinagrete as well. Vinagrete, this vinagrete. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, two uh, very representative images of our diversity on fairs and markets in some places. And I, one of my favorite uh, uh, pictures that I have here <laughs> that shows this biodiversity. You can go to the next one. Uh, some rare beans and pulses in Brazil. Why did I put rare in uh, commas? Because they are rare for people on, 
great urban centers for people that uh, consume this regularly on the countryside or are traditional people, this is not rare. It's quite common. So the aim of my project is to promote this um, cultural relevance of these um, foods. Uh, I will show uh, one by one. Well, we have uh, Baru. Wait, wait just a moment. We have Baru that I opened uh, yesterday. <laughs> that it's a, it comes from a Brazilian fruit of the Brazilian savanna, and it's uh, very delicious nut that it's from leguminosa family and uh, it tastes like peanuts very delicious and, and nutritious um, um we have uh kumaru kumaru uh, it's from the same genre of uh baru it's gypters and we use the, the the seed inside the fruit this is the fruit and this is the seed and this seed is uh, known in France as uh, fève tonka, in English tonka bean, used as, as a spice. Uh, we have andou bean. I don't know if um, you guys know this bean. It's a tiny one and used uh, on, it, it came from India and it's well um, cultivated here, mostly on agroforestry. Uh, to serve as a green manure on the, the crops. Uh, we have Lab Lab, that it's, it's uh, uh, being from, um, from India as well, from Southeast Asia. And it's uh, highly nutritious and you can use many parts of this plant on the culinary, on stews, um, on farofas, <laughs> farofa, it's, it's a mixture that we, we make here in Brazil with uh, cassava flour. Anything with cassava flour that is um, kind of dry, you can call farof. Then we have lima bean. We have a lima bean here that it's a white one that uh, we call fava. <laughs> it's a mistake. It, this is not fava that you know in Europe, but here we call fava. And it's typically from northeast of Brazil. Uh, we have yard long bean and winged bean that uh, are also um, uh, good to cultivate on tropical areas. You can go to the next slide. These are some uh, pictures. Uh, undo bean, uh, green and dry. This is andu bean, uh, black variety, lima bean. This, the other one is lima bean uh, with uh, some red stripes. This is winged bean uh, here. Here we have the lab lab. On the right, we have uh, the yard long bean that is used green as vegetable as well. And here we have the baru that I showed you on the video. You can go next. Other poses and their uses. Uh, we also have these um, poses that are not used on culinary, but have other um, specific uses, such as mukuna, this um, black one with a little white. I don't know if you are seeing on the video with a little white uh, line on the, at the center that is used on agroforestry as green manure, such as feijão de porco. Feijão de porco is the white one with black uh, a black line on, at the center. And uh, feijão espada, that is this purple, beautiful seed that is also used as green manure or fertilizer. We have a butterfly pea that have some um, uh, uses on the culinary as food dye. Uh, their flowers um, are used to, um, to make blue color on some recipes. These uh, came from uh, Southeast Asia, but well uh, uh, cultivated in Brazil. 
because of the climate. And we have Jacatupé that uh, in Mexico they they know as jicama, jicama, uh, which has the, the root used as food, not the bean. Well, I think that that that's it. <laughs> this is a brief overview of some um, different uh, beans that we have in Brazil, but we don't use them a lot. And I hope that in, uh, in a brief future, people know more about these beans and promote them in, on food, on landscapes, because they are really beautiful as well to use on, on home gardens and, and also in agroforestry. That's it. Thanks for the attention of all. And if you have any doubts, you can contact me later. Okay. Thanks so much, Lucas. Congratulations. It was really nice. Uh, nice travel in Brazil and the plants and their uses it was really nice to see that diversity that that we don't know so much in Europe. Some of the species you were talking about, I think that the uh, Eke will will also present his his experience growing them in Europe. I would like to invite now the second speaker, who is Victor from Hello. Spain. Victor. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Where is yours? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Victor. Um, you can, okay. You can yeah. Go okay. On. Okay. Okay. Well, my name is Victor Garcia from Spain. I'm a see the enthusiast, see the saver, and researchers about uh, uh, some uh, food uh, crops and useful plants and legumes and all that uh, rare plants. You know. Uh, well, uh, this time I will talk a little bit about, uh, as the title says, is knowing some exotic and underutilized legume crops. Okay, I am um, I'm going to present some of uh, very very uncommon uh, species, uh, mainly in Europe, um, because most of them are from uh, tropics and remote places from Africa, for example, um, they are very under, underutilized. So that's, a, that's about what I'm going to, to talk. They are very interesting plant. Uh, well, the exotic and common legumes in Europe, you know, is uh, something more or less new for, uh, for us. Most of the species are unknown still in Europe because they don't grow here mostly uh, because they are from the tropics and subtropic uh, places. They can grow maybe without uh, protection or something in winter. Uh, most of them are not easy to find in big stores. Uh, they can't even find some uh, um, seeds uh, stores, seeds um, uh, projects or something, because uh, some of them are uh, from very rural communities, uh, in maybe in the middle of the the you know the mountains in Africa or <laughs> or places like that, and and some of them are. are even a survival crop, like uh, one of the one of them, I'm going to talk about Marama bean, is a, a pure survival crop. Uh, they require very specific condition to grow. Uh, most of them, uh, like almost every 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 of them, are they like sensitive, and that's a, that's the main problem to grow here in Europe. The altitude, the humidity, because they grow uh, naturally in the in the wa uh, wet forest, in the um, jungle or something. The temperature uh, is double. <laughs> okay. Um, some of the some of them are uh, toxic. Um, they have toxic fruits, 
toxic uh, parts of the plant that cannot be eaten, even boiled or cooked. One of them is mucuna. It's uh, used just in a small, a small quantities, in medicinal and the leaves or roots, or maybe um, uh, ahipa, pachirritus ahipa. It can can no, cannot be eaten the leaves or roots or seeds, sorry. So well, I'm going to start the presentation of some of my uh, species. Well, we start with Fasciolus alcatifolius. It's not very uncommon, but it's uncommon for us in Europe. I think it's not uh, widely cultivated or cultivated here. Uh, this is more mostly cultivated in uh, uh, North America and nor uh, north of Mexico and South the States. It's from uh, I know them from uh, mm, from dead people of the the north of Mexico, uh, the Tarahumara people. They grow too. It can grow well in the desert condition in very arid and dry and very hot temperatures. It's the most resistant uh, Faseolus. It can, it can thrive with very low water requirements. The habit of growing is pole, is low in water requirement, not, not much. It's, and the sun exposure is more resist, it's, it, well, it's adapted to full sun exposure. Uh, so this can be a really nice uh, legume for the most uh, warm and arid uh, places in Europe, in the south, for example. Very nutrition bean uh, compared with uh, Faseulus vulgaris is, is, is the same, and it's not a daily sensitive, so it can be grown in most parts of Europe. The next one, I think is a very beautiful uh, bean, Faseolus dumosus, is known in Mexico and Guatemala, like frijol gordo. Uh, the origin is Central America. In Guatemala, it can be, it has been uh, found in wild uh, form, but it's very, it's still very um, unclear the origin because some studies say it may be a cross between Faseolus vulgaris and Faseolus coccineus. It can it can grow very well in mountain conditions in uh, wet, uh, uh, cool uh, temperatures, and the 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 habit of uh, growing is very is a very tall plant very with high production as a perennial habit it can it's very similar to Faseolus coccineus because it has a, a tuberous root which can be you can eat the root too like Faseolus coccineus the problem is is they like sensitive so i don't know if it can grow in some part of europe maybe uh, in northern parts or very or places with a uh, frost uh, free uh, winters and not very warm summers i don't see i have not seen this species outside of central america so i don't know maybe not i don't know if there are a a, a dumosus a cultivar grown growing in europe i don't know probably not well, the next one is a uh, interesting, um, interesting leguminous, Eritrina dulis. Uh, they call it pajuro, poroton, or balu. It's a, a tree uh, from uh, South America, uh, Peru, Andean region, or Colombia, or North uh, South America. It's a very resistant tree, uh, around 15 meters. So it's a, not a very tall a tree, but can be with a nice uh, shape and it's very, very uh, attractive. 
a long living and perennial. So they use there around the chakras or uh, about the around the milpas, how they call there. And it's not frost hardy, so it's not possible to grow in some parts of Europe. It's not for uh, temperate. The, run, the temperature range are mostly for subtropical places. They use the, the bean, which is very big. It's like uh, four, five centimeters long bean. It's very huge bean. And the pots are around 40, 30, 40 centimeters long. So, well, um, if you want to grow this, you need to be shown this, the fresh seed because the seed starts to germinate very soon, even fresh. So it cannot be dry because if not, the seed is spoiled. And they eat uh, from soups, uh, creams, arepas, pies. Um, it's a big uh, sort of almidon, a starch and protein and complement the other tubers diet. They eat uh, sancochado or boil it with cheese, with eggs and flour uh, for cookies tortas, um, but you never can e uh, eat this uh, fresh because it's very toxic. So you need to cook this very well before. Uh, the, taste is, the taste is sweet and they use for some candy sometimes. Um, for uses, for plant uses, it's very good for uh, um carpentry or construction so it's a nice species the next one this is a well this is a stenoph stenophthilis stenocarpa it's very interesting uh, species it's endemic from africa tropical is uh the family has uh, seven species it's a uh, very underutilized and in abandoned risk uh, crop. Uh, so you can only find land race if there are no commercial varieties. It's grown from a uh, level C until 18,000 meters above the level C. It's frost, uh, frost sensitive. So if frost tender, it can, it can grow under the winters. A very um, very cold winters, and the range of temperatures is in between nineteen and seventeen degrees. It's a perennial plant from one to three meters tall. Uh, the the flowers are in racine and pink. Okay, the most interest of the interesting thing of this of this variety of this uh, species is the uh, atuberus root which is a starch, a very rich starch uh, with the double of uh, nutrients than uh, sweet potato and most of uh, tubers. The seeds are used too. The seeds are rich in protein, even more than Fasolus vulgaris, Bambara bean or Cajanus cajan. It's very protein uh, uh, seed. It's a nutritional source about, uh, against the malnutrition in rural parts of Africa. And you can uh, eat this like uh, uh, the tuber raw, which is a very nice taste, or cook in salads or cook like a, a mashed potato with some uh, corn. And the seeds uh, can be cooked like a, a bean, normal bean, but the, the cook time is, uh, is uh, more time because the anti-nutrients in the seeds are more elevated. Uh, it can be grown where normal jam is grown, and but the, the, the growing is, is day, day length sensitive and the growing is very slow. 
Uh, so it's a really interesting species with a lot of potential, but uh, it needs to be to uh, study uh, more to adapt to northern regions. The next one. Well, this is the, for me, one of the most interesting species and a lost crop from Africa, Marama bean, uh, Tilosema sculentum. They call the green gold of Africa. It's a very underutilized and neglected crop. It, the, the, it's used just from, uh, for the Kalahari people like a, a protein and water supply or source is endemic from South Africa and native from Kalahari, uh, from the desert and savanna, and northern of Namibia and Botswana. The it grow like vines, uh, vines uh, from uh, all the parts, the part of the stem of the of the plant can grow every every part of the floor but never climb, it's just a, a prostratus growing a bit, okay? And can reach the six meters long, um, can form a geometric pattern. Um, it can grow uh, in very extreme uh, weather, can handle with 50 degrees and can handle frost. So this is a very interesting crop to uh, try in northern regions in Europe, uh, maybe in Spain too, in Italy, because uh, it can grow in very similar, some not well, well uh, similar uh, weather <laughs> conditions. The plant die, the aerial parts die when the when the winters come and uh, can handle frost. And again in in spring can grow again. So it's a very interesting uh, crop to to try. The tuber in uh, under the ground can reach the thir 13 uh, th uh, sorry, 300 uh, kilos, but for uh, consumption and edible um, you know edible uses the tuber need to be around one kilo or two kilos because if not it's very fibrous and is this need a uh, sandy soil to grow because if not the the tuber can't expand the seeds are very nutritious um because it, the oil content is very high. It's very, it's very uh, with it's a with a lot of protein content. The seeds they roast the seeds and eat like a, um, like a cashew nuts. The taste is very nice, and the root is 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 like a potato. So. The only problem of this uh, species is the lack of info about growing and so, and the knowledge about this plant. So it's a really nice plant to research. Uh, okay, another another species to consider a part of them. A part of them, it's Nunya, Nunya bean. I don't know if some. Someone here know Nunya bean. It's a Phaseolus vulgaris, a bean, but this is with the peculiarity that it's a popping bean. It's not a popping like a, a popcorn, but when they heat in the with oil in a pan, and the cotyledon separate and make it edible. Uh, some sources say this uh, is because the altitude from from uh, Andean regions and the boiling uh, the boiling problems sometimes with the with the water because it boiled before or something they use this method to to cook these beans. Same with some species of chickpeas. Uh, they can some species can uh, be heated and cooked in um, 
uh, oil and the chickpeas make a, a, po a popping uh, effect and they are edible with a very nice flavor, but not all of the varieties of chickpeas can be used for this. Another interesting species is Tarwi, and Lupinus mutabilis is a really nice source of protein. They are from the Andes. Uh, Pachirithus ahipa. Ahipa is uh, very similar to Sphenostilis stenocarpa, but uh, this can be grow in temperate regions because it's day land neutral and can be like an annual here uh, with the root. The root is the main part uh, that uh, they eat. The seeds and another part of the plant are toxic. And the root is very, very sweet and it's very nice. Another plant, ice cream bean. I think most of the people here know them. Is the, the white uh, flesh. Uh, they eat the white flesh. I think Lucas knows this very well. A palki is a species of acacia that grows in a in a very arid part from Bolivia. I know this species um, uh, from a, a good friend from Bolivia, Ruth, and it's a very interesting uh, um, acacia that they use there like coffee or ground in soups and with ají and other preparation. It's very interesting. And Apios americana is very similar in use to Phaseolus coccineus because the, the root is edible too and the seeds. A most of the, a lot of species can uh, can be used and in, in, in um, can be tried to to grow in northern regions. Most of them can be adapted. Another is impossible because the dayland sense the dayland uh, issues is very difficult to to adapt. But I have some friends in uh, Switzerland and Italy that grow uh, dayland beans covering with a black plastic every two hours. So <laughs> it's very crazy, but it, like an experiment is very it's cool. So well. I encourage people here to try most of these species and thank you for, for stay here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Victor. Really nice <laughs> world tour in a few minutes. Thanks to lots of interesting different legume species. I saw two persons in the chat asking where uh, it's possible to find seeds for those species. We're going to talk about it after the the, the okay. presentation. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult for some of them. We cannot let you know. Like, in, it's possible that some of them are almost um, impossible to get in, in Europe. It's but very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was also a question from Charlotte asking if, uh, Victor, if you think that tepare bean would be a good option for a climate like Central Europe where the summers are very, very dry and hot. Do you think it yeah. could work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you have uh, problems growing the, the common beans, the Faseolus vulgaris, in some areas, depending on, on your soil type and the climate, you could try tepare bean. Yeah. Sounds of like course, it. yeah, they can thrive with no problem. Yeah. Good. If you have more questions, don't just ask them in the chat and we will uh, have a look and ask them to the speakers. Uh, we can go to the next speaker, who is Ji Young from South Korea, uh, who is going to tell us more about two different native species from Korea, which are not very known in Europe. So please, Ji Young. Thank you, Nicholas. And hi, everyone. I am Ji Young Moon from KBIN Project in South Korea. And KBIN means as you can guess, Korean bean. And today I will introduce two different types of Korean native beans. But the K-Bean project is not just a project to introduce Korean beans. It aims to connect all stakeholders mm -hmm. of the bean, make people the co-producer of the beans. And as you can see the photo here, it's from last October. Our K-Bean project team has chance to visit 
Germany last year. And maybe you can recognize Lisa there and Anne there. Seems like Anne is not here today, but I really miss her today. And the person in the middle with black shirt, that's me. Uh, we had a chance to introduce Korean native seed to Berlin people last year. And we achieved a lot of attention on beans from Berlin people. Very nice experience. And would you please go back to the first slide? Yeah, thank you. Because I like to say something about the logo of K Bean. There is a lot of lines surrounding the word K Bean, which means uh, through the bean, we try to connect all the people in the environment, climate, and biodiversity, and the value of this precious seed. So the K-Bean project is about the connection with the bean. Okay, so next slide and the next slide. Thank you. The native seed. I also put Korean word after the native seed. And actually today's theme was introducing the exotic seed. And I thought exotic seed can be taken as native seed. Um, and uh, I don't think the native seed do not just mean that they started and grew in certain place from the very beginning. So even if they came from abroad, if people receive the seed from it and plant them again, grow them again and harvest again, it can be said to be native seed. So the first native seed, ne next slide, please. Yep, next slide, please. yes. This white swallow kong. The kong means bean in Korean words. So I can say white slow bean. Well, this one is also from abroad. The academic name is Dolichus lap lap. And it is a bean native to the tropical areas of Africa. And as you can see in the picture, it is flat and white. And the bean's eye around the bean resembles a swallow's beak. So that's why in Korea, we call it white swallow kong, the white swallow bean. And it grows long like a vine and grows on a fence or wall. Next slide, please. And these are the flowers of the white slow swallow cone, white swallow bean. This white swallow cone is quite hard. So in Korea these days, people are growing this bean for ornamental plants, for beautiful garden rather than eating it. Next slide, please. And last Sunday, I went to a farmer's market held in Seoul, Korea, and the farmer came and talked about the importance of the native seed and the beans and distributed seed to people for free. And white so swallow bean were the most popular, so most people took them all. And I asked farmer if it was possible to grow white swallow bean in Germany. I asked him, would it be possible? And the farmer said, the native seed themselves are seed that already sur survived in various climate conditions. And that, and then, so this white swallow bean also can be survived in Germany because as they already survived in climate with four distinct seasons in Korea. So if the native seed in Korea, which means they survive from four different seasons, so the farmers said they probably can survive from all over the country. However, the appearance and taste can be slightly changed according to the climate condition, I guess. Next slide, please. Yes, and the second bean I like to introduce is Sombi Kong, Sombi bean. And the economic name of this one is Glycymas Med, which is the kind of soybean. And the soybean, the most common bean in Asia, especially the Northeast Asia, including Korea. And in particular, this bean, there is a historical record of it. 
And it says it has been cultivated in Korea region for more than hundreds of years. And there is a story about this bean. You can see there's a round black spot on the bean. And this resemble the shape of a head of zombie. I will tell you what zombie is later on. And people say <clears throat> this black spot resembles an ink splashed on the bean. And this bean planted in mid-June and harvest in November. Next slide, please. Yes, Kingdom. Uh, this is a Korean drama aired on Netflix two years ago. Has anyone seen it? Yes, I saw AK, saw it. Benny, no. Yes, yes, no. So you probably are familiar with this Kingdom drama as Korean zombie drama. And uh, the historical background of this drama is early 1600s. And at that time, Thumbi <clears throat> was one of the ruling class. And these Thumbis were always, Thumbi we call it a noble people with noble personality who always devoted to studying. And these people are always wearing hat like this. So does this hat resemble the pattern of Thumbi Kong, do you think? And the Sambi people enjoyed calligraphy. They always writing. And this culture experience program of Sambi writing calligraphy is quite common in Korea today too. Even young children on the right photo, they also do this Sambi culture experience. And calligraphy is also the symbol of classical Sambi. And do you think this ink marks that sp splatter on this Sambi Kong resemble to the calligraphy of zombie, I don't know. It's like, yeah, so-called educated people on 1600s in Korea. Okay, so next slide, please. There was a, like simple cultural background of zombie Kong. And the zombie Kong look like this when they grow and similar to soybean. Right, and the next slide, please. And bean, that goes well with rice. Uh, I remember uh, Lucas said, the bean and the rice are the staple food for the, the Brazilian people, same in Korea. And Koreans eat cooked rice every day. And when cooking rice, beans or rice grains are added together. And the sambikong goes so well with the rice. The taste of sambi kong, sambi bean is sweet and savory like chestnut and the texture is chewy. Actually, I also have sambi kong here with me. I bought it from the farmer's market last Sunday. Next slide, please. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, however, the climate change, that's the issue what we are facing these days. Even the same beans can have different shapes depending on the climate conditions. Um, the native seeds adapt flexibly to nature and environment because they are not commercialized seeds. So they always survive from the given condition. So as you can see, same zombie corn variety, but things on the left are grown from the Northern side of Korea. And the sambikong on the right side is grown from the south part of Korea. And you can see the, see the distinctive difference between two of these. And the, I believe the advantage of planting a variety of native seed is that there are seeds that survive because each seed has different characteristics. And we can see life can continue even in the climate crisis. Next slide, please. And this cute uh, smiling bean is the storyteller of the cave project. And this one is the most cultivated bean, the soybean in Korea and in Northeastern Asia. And soybean basically grow well, even in poor soil, devastated soil. 
So just because it is a bean, we cannot say it survives well unconditionally. And we also cannot say the native seed can survive everywhere because it is a native species. But uh, since it's native bean, native seed, if we plant it, we can protect biodiversity by finding, cultivating, growing, and exchanging instead of seeding system for commercialized trade. Next slide, please. So beans, especially the soybeans, they grow well in dry places. And soybeans taste better when planted in dry ground. So sambikong expected to be grow well in the German climate, I guess. And just as the cabin logo signifies various connections centered on beans, and I wish Korean beans can be connected to the Germany as well. And you can see this cabin logo t-shirt is already worn by the AK, the greatest gardener I've ever met in Germany. Uh, just let you know, he will be the next presenter. And uh, I hope that more people grow, harvest, and eat exotic and native beans contributing to the biodiversity conservation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ji Young. That was really nice to see two different species from South Korea and a bit of, of the culture, which is very far from Europe, but very similar in some ways. Nice to see that you already connected so well with, with Eke, who is our next speaker. Um, we had two new questions in the chat. There was one, I think, uh, for Victor, which was referring to the tepary bean again, asking if the spring is very dry. Does it also work to have this tepary bean? Can it be grown in, in dry places where spring is also very dry, Victor? Victor, you are muted. Still, you need to unmute. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's possible to grow the party beans where the spring is dry. This bean is a, is is well adapted to to dry conditions, so no problem at all. At, at least it will do better than normal fasciolus <clears throat> dry beans. Of course, yeah. And there was a question from Liz about uh, the lectin content of of uh, beans. If there are there are some specific ways to prepare them so that you avoid uh, consuming too much lectins, which are antinutrients, yeah. And asking also if the tubers and the leaves also contain lectins. Question to all speakers. Victoria, yeah, about uh, I told in the in the reply about what I, what I am researching and the the, the lectins and antinutrients in those species. Normally, the 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 species which are uh, mainly used uh, for roots just eat the roots because the aerial aerial parts uh, have a lot of anti nutrients. This happens with uh, Pachyrhizus ahipa, for example. Uh, aerial parts are toxic. Uh, it uh, has a a, a a substance or a compound inside which is uh, is called rotenone it's very toxic but the the roots are are edible are sweet and can be used like a potato so the species which is uh, for a uh, root consumption just eat the root and if the species can be uh, eaten the aerial parts just you can use a uh, properly cook the aerial parts Normally, some of them, like a Phenostilis stenocarpa, uh, the boiling the boiling time is very superior to normal beans. So they they are cooking the bean more than four to six hours, even twelve hours of cooking. So it's a lot. So the difference between the lectins and antinutrients between the species is very high. Thanks a lot, Victor. On this okay. complete answer. I think we need to move forward. Uh, and I will give the word to Eke, who you already know. Eke in Berlin, please. Uh, yes, hello. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about, about the global field in Berlin, where, as I mentioned, uh, legumes are an important part of what we show there. 
it is not only that the fourth largest uh, um, uh, a crop is is a legume indeed a soybean, uh, but it's uh, it's also that we have a wide variety of other legumes there. Maybe we would uh, advance first slide, please. Um, so uh, legumes, you you have uh, you, you were give, given some, uh, a lot of examples today, but the the family itself is of course uh, vast. It's over twenty thousand species, over seven hundred fifty uh, genera. Um, and it's used for, for many different things. Uh, of course, mainly used and mainly grown as a source of food, as protein for animals and uh, humans. And then the second, uh, maybe the second uh, most important uh, use is to grow it as a fertilizer. Yeah, if in uh, organic agriculture, we uh, introduce um, green manure, legumes uh, in, in the crop cycle. This is actually growing legumes as a fertilizer. Uh, but there are other uses. There, there, uh, some of them are used as fruit and, and uh, as spice. Uh, you might uh, know carob or certainly you know tamarind or fenugreek. Those are used as uh, the, the latter two as uh, uh, spices or tamarind even as a fruit. Uh, then they are uh, widely used as ornamental plants. Uh, uh, we have seen some ornamental uh, beans already. I would show you another few which are ornamental, but there are uh, some trees, uh, bushes, and uh, perennial plants uh, which are also used as uh, ornamental plants, which are uh, legumes, bobinia, mimosa, uh, perennial lupines uh, are grown in Europe as, as an orna ornamental plant. Then as a dye, um, there are different indigofera, as the name uh, already tells you, it is uh, used to prepare indigo. And then uh, we have just heard about rotenone. Uh, this is a, uh, or it was used as a, as a, a pesticide. I, I don't think that it's, uh, that's still uh, in use. This is produced by Tifosia, for example, uh, uh, or some Desmodium are yeah, uh, also used. Um, yeah, not quite as a, as a pesticide, but uh, uh, to prevent uh, certain um, pests. And then uh, uh, very widely used different medicinal uses in, in traditional uh, medicine. There are uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of species which, uh, which are used like that. I've just uh, mentioned a few uh, that I met in Uganda, which were really widely used there, Trigonella, Dismodium again, and Senna. Senna are also very beautiful plants. Next slide, please. Uh, in the European context, uh, bean equals fasciolus. Let's be clear about that. We go to a supermarket, or so we, if we plan to go to a supermarket to buy beans, we mean fasciolus. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. It's uh, getting a little uh, little bit different uh, over the last few years, but in general, I would say, uh, this is uh, still the case. Um, uh, this has not always been like this, as you might have learned today. Also, Fasiolus comes from the Americas, uh, the different Fasiolus. And before the Columban exchange, uh, they are, uh, the, the bean uh, grown here in Europe was uh, fava bean. Yeah? Um, but apart from this uh, perception that a bean is uh, fasciolus and it's usually eaten as a vegetable, um, there are many other large grain legumes which are called either beans or peas. Uh, many of them are tropical or subtropical uh, plants which grow in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. They come from a different climate, from different precipitations. They receive different rainfall patterns as we have here in Europe. Uh, they are used to different soil uh, uh, conditions, uh, but plants are very adaptive. Yeah? And uh, you should also understand that uh, our summer in, in Berlin, uh, I recently had, had a visitor from Uganda. She came out of the, of the plane and she complained how hot it was. Yeah? So um, uh, it is possible during summer to grow uh, tropical vegetables here. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the first one that I would like to introduce, we have heard about it already, but I would like to point to uh, the, uh, the flower, which is, um, it is, by the way, my, my favorite one. 
It is a perennial um, uh, plant. Uh, it's called uh, Strauchherbs in German, uh, Poire d'Angol in, in, in French, and Pigeon Pea in, in English. Uh, it is the most widely eaten and planted uh, legume in India, even on the on um, uh, on the global field. It has uh, um, a plot which is larger than lentil and uh, and peas combined. Yeah, so it is. Uh, whilst we don't know it, it is very important worldwide. Yeah, um, it grows up to three or four meter high. It is a perennial plant, as mentioned. Um, and uh, with a little pre-culture, if you have a greenhouse or even uh, in, uh, inside your living room, uh, you can start pre-growing it from, from April on and transplant it end of May. It is not winter hardy, so either you bring it back in and enjoy the, the beautiful, beautiful plant inside, or it will wither away, it will, will uh, die. It cannot survive our winter. And also, our, uh, uh, I, I've never harvested any uh, any pigeon peas uh, from from it since our our season is too short. But still, I love the plant. It is very beautiful. And if you have a look at the flower, who would not love this plant? Next slide, please. Uh, then a plant which is really really easy to grow can grow in any garden is uh, the uh, mung bean mungbohne in German. Um, this is actually uh, quite widely used here in uh, in in Europe, but not the beans. Uh, they are also used more and more, uh, but more if you buy soy uh, sprouts then they come from mung bean, uh, like in 99% of the cases, it's, it's mung bean sprouts. And so a lot of people eating already uh, some parts of the plants. Uh, they are quite, um, I, I, like, I like to prepare with them um, as I find uh, they are really, they can really nicely carry taste and you can turn them in whatever uh, uh, direction you want to, either as a, as a sweet, as something which is very, uh, uh, spicy, um, uh, and um, you, you can use it as a paste uh, seasoned at your um, convenience. Uh, what is said, I don't know about it, uh, I cannot guarantee it, but it is said that uh, mung bean uh, is the, uh, causes the least problems if you have problems, you know, with flatulence, as the, um, as the scientific term is for that. Uh, this one is, um, I can only say this is uh, uh, in terms of difficulty to grow. This is, uh, a child can do that. There's absolutely no problem with that. Direct sowing from uh, mid to end May, rather end of May, and then you shall harvest your, your mung beans uh, at home. Planting distance, I've written that down here. That depends on the variety and um, the planting density that you, that you wish, but I have written what, what we use uh, at the global field. Um, very beautiful flowers also, and uh, easy to grow. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a close relative, as you, as you can see from the, uh, from the genus name. Um, this is Kaupi. Kaupi also, as you can see, very, very beautiful flower. Um, is also extremely easy to grow in Berlin. Uh, it rather grows too much than it grows uh, not enough. Um, and we also, we always harvest quite a lot of uh, those uh, dry beans. Um, it is really drought resistant. Um, uh, and um, yeah, you are right, Nicolas. Uh, Niebe is uh, rather used in West Africa, but that's where I learned French. Uh, the direct sowing in this case, end of May, uh, planting distance depends a little bit on your uh, on the variety that you find. Some are really trailing quite a lot. Uh, others can uh, can climb, uh, but in general, uh, at least as easy to grow as the one before. Uh, so this is really something which can spice up your garden uh, to grow something uh, which is a little bit different. And uh, cowpeas, of course, are. Um, um, can be turned into very uh, tasty uh, spread or paste or things like that, or eaten in a stew or as a salad, as we have seen from our uh, friend from, from Brazil. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
Uh, okay, so this is a subspecies of the one that we had before. Uh, this is yard long bean, uh, Dulik uh, asperge, um, Spargelbohne or meter long bean in, in, in German. Uh, this is an excellent vegetable. Yeah, like the, the if you harvest the, uh, the pots early, if they are still young, um, this is one of the most tasty uh, beans uh, I've ever encountered. Uh, they are also not very difficult to grow. They have a little bit problems with aphids, as all beans have, or almost all, all beans have. But I never found it worth treating. They, uh, they survived the attacks and uh, produced quite nicely. Uh, for us, of course, this bean is ideal at the global field because if children come and you show them a bean, which is one meter long, uh, they are impressed, and who does not like impressed school children? Then um, they 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 concentrate a little better. Uh, I always uh, sow them directly, but you can pre-grow them, uh, and of course they need a climbing support. Uh, for all of them which I've shown you, I'm uh, it's really best uh, in full sun, maybe a little shade, but uh, please not too much. Yeah. Um, Flowers are also uh, quite delicate and, and beautiful, I find, with that light blue. And uh, you can also harvest the dry beans if you prefer those ones and prepare them like you would prepare any other um, uh, uh, um, dry bean. So next slide, please. Um, uh, yeah, OK. So Lab Lab, we also talked about that. Uh, um, uh, Ji Jung uh, told us that it looks like a, a swallow. Uh, we, we think it looks more like a helmet, which uh, <laughs> I mean, we could discuss this. Uh, this is hyacinth bean. Um, there are also other names. Lab Lab is a, is a, a commonly used name. Um, it is a perennial plant, which is most beautiful in the garden. Yeah? Those purple flowers, uh, if you bring them to flower, uh, this is uh, really something which adds interest to your garden, and uh, even the uh, the pots are more than yes, are more than uh, yeah. They are very nicely looking. Yeah, this is really something if you plant it somewhere on your balcony or on your uh, in a nice spot in your garden, uh, your neighbors will ask you what is it and want to share the seeds with you. Um, this one, uh, if I'm well informed, uh, the uh, must be uh, well cooked before eating. And I had sometimes difficulties. Uh, I will come to that uh, where I source sometimes my seeds. I had sometimes difficulties with day length. Yeah, so the, some of the the plants which I planted uh, started flowering very late in end of September or mid of September, and that was too late to produce. Uh, and I very much suspect that that was uh, day length sensitivity. Um, anyways, uh, one which I can really um, uh, recommend and which would be, I would be very glad to see more of them uh, on balconies in Berlin. And um, yeah, I think they, they have also a, a nice uh, smell. Um, next one, please. Yeah, winged bean. Uh, we also heard about this one. This one is the most interesting plant uh, because all parts can be eaten from the roots to the le young leaves and shoots uh, to the uh, young pots. Uh, they are best eaten uh, if they are still very young, that is like uh, five centimeters or something. And um, or you, you harvest the, the, the seeds and you can also pre uh, uh, prepare them. Uh, they're very rich in, in uh, protein. And uh, as you can see, also the flowers are not, uh, uh, not bad. Uh, the, the pots look very, very different from anything that you would call a, a bean. Um, uh, if you ask for the water needs, this one needs quite a lot of water. Uh, the, all the others before, well, um, uh, they, they are okay with what they find in Berlin, and Berlin has not that much uh, um, rain. Um, uh, the wing bean should be pre-grown and transplanted. They are a little, um, uh, they, they are a little 
difficult in terms of uh, transplanting. They don't like it much, but they, since they have no choice, uh, what uh, what can they do? Uh, sometimes they grow a little slow, slow in the beginning, but then they climb. Yeah, uh, needs full sun, needs a warm place, a balcony, for example, uh, on south side. Um, this is not. Uh, um, this is, uh, and it also, it doesn't like the wind too much. That has to do also with the temperature, I would say. Um, try it. Uh, this, this is really very ornamental, also the pots, yeah? The, not only the flowers. So um, I think we have another one. Yeah, this one, as you can see from the flower, has its botanical name for a reason. Um, uh, it is, it is mainly used as a dye, uh, but also you can prepare a tea from it. Gives a nice blue color. So if you ever fancy to eat blue rice or drink blue tea, I've heard it's now also used uh, with some gins because in in gin is it blue, and if you add the tonic, it turns uh, tonic is uh, alkaline. If you add something alkaline, it turns uh, into pink. Um, the, the flower, blue flower, you will also um, uh, get mainly on slightly uh, acidic soils. Uh, they turn pink if it's, if it's alkaline, the soil. Um, it is uh, something also which is very nice on the balcony, have, has really beautiful flowers. The flowers can be eaten. Of course, if you have uh, flowers like this on, sprinkled on top of your salad, uh, that might uh, create some, you know, like <laughs> it looks just nice. Um, needs also a very uh, a warm and sunny place, uh, but, is, is, but it is not uh, complicated to grow. Yeah? The, you can even buy it uh, sometimes um, uh, now in, in garden markets. Okay, this is also something for the balcony as I've written. Okay, sources of seeds. One thing I would like to add before uh, I stop talking is, um, if I can't find seeds of different beans from all over the world, I just go to the next Asia or Africa market or shop uh, or, in, or in, the, in the next uh, bio uh, supermarket and I buy the seeds just there. You know, those things that they sell as dry beans, of course, you can sprout them and, uh, and plant them in the garden. Yeah? This is, in many cases, this works. And if you can't find the seeds, what will you do? Yeah? Or if the seeds are too expensive, sometimes 10 seeds cost 5 euros. This is, of course, outrageous. Yeah? Uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can get that cheaper and prepare something at home and uh, keep 10 seeds for, you, for yourself and plant them in the garden. In most cases, it works really well. So uh, this was all from my side. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your patience and um, hope to see you soon at the Global Field in Berlin. Thanks a lot, Eke. That was great. Thanks for sharing your experience as a gardener in, in Berlin, trying all kinds of exciting plants from abroad. And thanks also for introducing the topic, the, the hot topic of where can we find those seeds if we are maybe in Europe for most of you. Um, I just put a link in the chat. You can uh, open this if you want, or just follow on, on the screen, which I share. We started uh, in the Global Bean team. We started a table, which is um, the idea is that everyone can contribute. So the idea is to share uh, the, the nice tips where to, where to find seeds for interesting legumes. We started this long ago. Now for this specific event, I just added two links in the end of uh, web shops. I found um, that um, commercialized seeds of some of these exotic species. Uh, the rest, mm, some of them may have some exotic species, but mostly they, they say the European species and varieties. Um, some of the species, which uh, for instance, Victor showed, I'm almost sure they are impossible to find in, um, in, in, in gardening shops in, in, in Europe. So you would need to, to ask. Is he, to, I, have, I have not seen, uh, no. for example, Pachirithus ahipa, for example, I have not seen in European shops. Nunia, for example, is a very peculiar uh, bean. And, well, it's very difficult to grow anyway in, in some part of Europe. Maybe in some, very mild climate places like for example north of italy south of spain the coast 
maybe i don't know because uh, the the temperature and requirement of nunia for example are very precise and uh, well it's it's very it's very exigent in about the day length uh, so well most of them are are not are not easy to find philosema sculentum is possible to find in rare palm seeds uh, Eritrina edulis is well i have not seen at all as a stenostilis stenocarpa, uh, same. I, I have not seen uh, seeds in European uh, stores. So, well. <laughs> exactly. It's really difficult. Uh, but please, people, if you see that with us, uh, please just add your, your tips here. The last two I added, there is one in the Netherlands. The other one is in the USA. And I just saw that they don't send they don't ship to the european union so you would need to have a friend in in england for instance who can get them for you or something like that it's a bit tricky but we also have another solution to to share which is also linked to our next event which lisa is going to present soon we have also started a table for sharing seeds among uh, partners of the global bean and also more interested people who join our seed festival so this table is, is in the same link i i added now um, the first one I, I made a mistake you should open the second uh link so the the first sheet here underneath the table that you see there are four sheets we were in the fourth one which is sources of legume seeds which lists some shops and on the first one you can uh, like i started to do just add one line per variety that you have that you have the capacity to share and then you add your email address so that people can contact you so i just added some of the ones i have uh, enough quantity to share please do the same so we will have a lot of entries in this table and then people can can see that which beans or pulses you have to share there is another sheet where you can also write what you are looking for so it's the same principle as the first sheet you just write one line variety so here you see that i'm looking for a few fasciolus vulgaris beans i wrote the variety here and then i'm also looking for some of the species we were talking about today um i know that i can probably find some in in some of the shops i just show you but i thought it's nice to also uh, promote exchanges and just send some small seed bags per post so please have a look at this table and fill it in and it will be active uh, until yeah the summer probably so it can be a nice tool to exchange i go back to the presentation we are going to have a very short discussion and maybe some some um, questions that we that haven't been answered yet but maybe first i let lisa present the next event which is linked to this seed swap id oops sorry here lisa Yes, thank you very much, Nicola, and to thank you to all the speakers. And actually, it's a very good introduction, the sheet that you showed us, Nicola, because the idea to swap seeds is uh, is coming uh, from our seed festival, an event that we organize on the 22nd of April. And you are all very welcome to join either on a location that is taking part we have so far different initiatives joining the movement and organizing a festival in Greece, in Albany, in, in Germany, in France, in Austria, in Spain, in um, Ethiopia as well. Uh, but if you are not, if you don't have the luck to be so uh, close to uh, one of these locations, you can also watch an online program on that day that will take place from 1 to 2.30 in the afternoon. And from your screen, comfortably at home, you can also follow what is happening in the different locations and you can listen to exciting stories around um, how to save some legumes, legume species. Maybe some of them that we heard of today will be also part of the program. So yeah, we invite you to register to the to the online page that we are putting in the chat so that you can join the the online event. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I also encourage you to join. It's a really it's going to be really nice with different places connected at the same time doing the same thing. Um, 
please fill in our feedback questionnaire. Take just one minute to do this. It will help us a lot. And um, I saw some questions we didn't answer in the chat. There was Rene asking something to Eke. Unfortunately, Eke is gone. But if you are in Berlin, maybe you managed to meet him in person. Uh, you were asking which beans or legumes are recommended from an efficient standpoint for a garden market in Berlin. I would recommend you to try the, um, the yard long beans if uh, the idea to is to sell vegetables. I've seen them grown in the south of Germany. I don't know if they were grown in um, greenhouse or outside, uh, but I've seen them on markets uh, there. So I guess it could work in Berlin as well. Do we have more questions from the chat? There, is, there are some people suggesting some uh, entries for our table. I hope we can save the chat so we can add them in afterwards. Please also just feel free to, to include those uh, directly in, in the table. We will also send the link to everyone who participated. Uh, name of that black eyed bean stuffed recipe in Brazil. This is a question for Lucas. Is Lucas still here? I don't know what time it is in, in Brazil. No, I think he he has to go. I think ah, yeah, okay. it's, it's not here. Maybe we managed to find the, the answer to this question. I have the slide here in front of me. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. It, yeah, I'm not sure if it was a, a traditional recipe or a, a recent invention. So I, I don't know. Sorry. We have more questions. Yes, the one bottom right. That's, that's true. Yeah, I see which one you mean, but we can try to Google all the, the recipes that uh, Lucas put in the list. I just copied them here again. Maybe it's one of those, but maybe not. Um, let me check one. I'm just guessing. What could be that one? We can ask. Akara Akaraje. Okay, I try. Akaraje. I don't know if the name. Akaraje. Black eyed bean salad. No. It's oh yeah, one. that's the one. You're right. Is that is that Akaraje? Akaraje is indeed the one which. Uh, I put which was the black egg stuffed uh, where in some dough. So just type this in, in, in Google and you will see lots of recipes showing up. We are a little bit um, late. Sorry for that. Thanks to all of you who stayed until the end. If you have a few more questions, I think we can still take one or two. I was really, really, really uh, happy to see such a diversity and, and also to get some concrete uh, growing tips for people in New York. I, I hope that um, some of my wishes for uh, seeds that I've put in the table will, will become reality. Here in Spain, I, I have a nice mild climate, so I can probably grow some of these tropical species. Please make use of this seed uh, exchange table it will be really nice if we have it full of lots of people sharing seeds and asking okay i don't see more questions if you have questions afterwards you can still uh, send it to Eke, Eke is not here, right? Sorry? Eke, Eke left already, yeah. Okay. I had to ask him a question about the the winged bean, yeah. uh, which which variety he grows, because winged bean, most of them are dialect sensitive. So yeah. I don't know how we can grow in Germany. I've seen in the in the in this um website from the US, uh, they sell one, which is not daylink sensitive. I, I'm sure. Yeah. Uri soon. I have some seeds of that variety. Oh. I had I had to try. And please, uh, if you have enough to send me a few, it will be really nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, it's, it's, the, it's the only one I 
I have seen a daily and a neutral. Mm -hmm. So the others I have are daily uh, sensitive. It's a very, very interesting nice species. Box. Yeah. Anyway, I, I encourage the people here who has a green a big greenhouse to plant most of these species because under uh, under protection under you know under a, a, a greenhouse, I think most of them can grow uh, and adapt uh, year by year to the condition of the place they are growing. So I think it's not difficult. I think, for example, some, uh, uh, I don't know, some nunas, for example, can grow in some parts in greenhouses. Um, most of the, of the leguminous uh, can grow in a greenhouse with no problem. Great. I forgot I had prepared this slide to thank our four speakers again. Uh, Lucas, Victor, Ji Young, and Eke. You will have those links also in, in the email. And if you have more questions, you can write to the email address, which is on the bottom of this slide. Thank you, Nicola, also for coordinating this event uh, together with Victor. And perhaps you can uh, remove the screen sharing so we can see each other less time, see who is all in the room. Thank you so much for staying with us all of you and have a very good evening. I hope you will be many to join us in the Seed Festival and we are looking forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ji Young, for staying with us so late. I know it's uh, amazingly late in the night in, in South Korea, so thanks so much. It was, I was glad to see you uh, all in the meeting today. Bye. Bye. Bye.